Son that made me famous. Someone. <laughs> well, it got me a crap ton of fans in the process of my first. Today would have been Betty Wine's 100th birthday. Yeah. Oh yeah. Today's so also my great aunt's 102nd birthday. Damn. Imagine living up to a century. Interesting. Oh, there was a woman in France who lived to 127. Damn. That's yeah, boy. my my grandmother kind of wanted to do that before. Uh, yeah, she did pass. Sorry, man. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Dustin. Didn't also tell you. Apparently, my grandfather tested positive. Oh, shit. Good. I'm sorry, sorry yeah. to hear that. Is he vaccinated or something? I have no idea. Oh, well, hopefully he gets I'm going to pray to God he makes through it. COVID cases are going up like crazy. Oh, it makes me... Oh, yeah. Well, Omicron is more contagious, but it's not as deadly. Un un again, barring if you don't have any comorbidities, so yeah. No, this is kind of the cycle I mean, of... Either what? way, it's still like... I don't even want to step out of the house. No, this is kind of the cycle of what happened because he was in the hospital for a month straight, then a nursing home for now a month straight. Pretty much COVID outbreak happened at the freaking nursing home. Now that's another problem. Nursing and, homes. And also, they were about to kick him out, too. Oh, hi, Shay. Oh, shit. And hey, it's a mess. We still, we've never lost our power. Now those in Central North Carolina did because they got bad ice. I was gonna ask, how was the snowstorm? <laughs> it's it tame. Oh. I mean, there were trees that were knocked down in some places, but it didn't hit any power lines. Damn. I also heard. Uh, what other place got a bad snowstorm? Were there? I think. Cal told me that it was in Ohio as well that they got a lot of snow. Okay, snow. yeah. Um, my friend Cal, uh, Shane knows Cal. Uh, American Picker Ohio. lives in Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh damn! I ain't far from him. Oh wow. And uh, then again, unless there's a freaking you and hour like down the street from me, yeah. Something like yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I think it was snowing around where Nate is, but... We got man. 10... Oh. We got a foot of snow at home. I showed you, Morgan. I showed you how deep my foot was going into the snow. Yeah, you got way more snow out there than whatever the frick kind of... Well, it's melting now. Are. Although, we're going to get another one this weekend. Hold up. I'm checking the weather. At least around here, for God's sake, because... Yeah. Oh my god, did I not have to pull up Microsoft Edge? Because Microsoft Edge can suck it. Huh. Ah, oh, great. Oh, clouds. And I'm under quarantine, too, so yeah. The mm. only danger right now is just black ice. Nah. Oh, wait, shit. I ride a scooter. Oh, thank you, Damn Shay. It. I thought you were already sub um fan to me. But then again... No, it does the stupid Yeah, you know glitch. it does that stupid shit. It's annoying. No, the worst thing is now, it's making me re-fan Ira every broadcast. What? It's been for the last month. Oh my god. And I'm like, you now, fix your crap so I could still actually be fan to one of my friends on here. That's another thing I would have asked the CEO of you now or that content creator guy. No, I seen I had... I got thrown on the spot. I had no time to think. Oh, you're good. It's all right. At least you Actually, asked. Am I even kidding? I only written on a notepad like two questions. Yeah, you asked him about the guessing thing, which that's probably not going to happen. No, it still says on here: two new guest spots, 
bar giveaways to be more controlled. But that second one, he just went into U.S. gambling laws, and I felt like going to sleep. I mean, I still don't get that. If they're not going to add any more guessing spots, why did they move it, the guest spots on this side? It makes... It's still freaking weird. I think Val... Okay, no joke. It was kind of my fault that Val actually went into a long-ass tangent about this, but I remember part of it. It was mostly for wider displays. And I have two wider displays next to me, but you now you're forgetting. I have a crappy ass 19 inch monitor. It wasn't even that bad when it was when the guest when it was down in there though. That's what I'm saying. I don't know, it's weird. Oh there. Actually I can guess I can check right now. <laughs> All right, we're okay. Round Pump Day, which is Wednesday. We're seeing another system coming. Okay, Wednesday night. Okay, no, 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 that'll be in East Tennessee. Uh, I mean West Tennessee. Okay, it should be around Thursday. We might get some wintry mix, snow, but it might not come until. Yep. Okay. Really starting to come in on Friday. This is my area. Oh. And you go through um, to Friday, we're going to get another system in. <laughs> so I'm tempted to troll with this. What you think of the trolling with? No, actually, people are from the snowstorms. Oh. No, I was gonna send this. This could be us, but we live in Florida. <laughs> but believe it or not, Florida did get some snow up north or something. Yeah, in the northern part, and there's been the occasional rare snow. I think yeah, it's I mean, cool though when you see snow amongst palm trees. That's cool. Martin, That's what creepy. up? I don't know. I can't take that seriously. What's up, Lone Wolf? Thanks about your fans, Martin. Much appreciated, yo. Although, in they did have a yeah, the northern portion of Florida has a freeze warning and the frost advisory. Yeah. Oh, that's Jacksonville, Gainesville. Oh, I've been trying to center it right. And Ocala. That's crazy. Yeah. Thanks for the team and the BFD. I swear to God, though, I better actually be getting back to freaking work by next week. So how long? But, uh, so wait, how long are you? How many more days are you off? Hopefully, it's af until after Wednesday. All right. Although my mom's okay. getting her test. Okay, getting, for uh, Connecticut. I see spots on roadways into early Tuesday morning. Yeah, no freaking piss along with my damn hills being iced all the freaking time. I'm someone who walks back and forth to work. Ugh. Oh, wait. I'm out leaving the house anyway, so. <laughs> oh, God. Also, I swear to God, today alone, I think I've been losing my mind. Especially after binging two movies all the way through. And happy Martin Luther King Day to everybody. <laughs> happy MLK Day. 
Right. Also, I'm thankful that my freaking work program didn't call me today because it's a day off from there. Although tomorrow my freaking stuck up like Ted, up to dumbass bosses. Yeah, that's the weekly view of our area. Yeah, I was just looking. Going, hey, pretty background, but yeah. Oh my god. But yeah, Dustin, I finally started watching uh, some Studio Ghibli movies. Mm -hmm. Watched Nausicaa, Valley of the Wind, and My Neighbor Totoro. Huh. I swear to god, My Neighbor Totoro almost made me goddamn emotional for a freaking four and ten year old. Yes, I can get emotional at crap. I'm out of freaking pissed off doing Hey, all the let time. me tell you something. No, it's I not cried. Shit. Okay. Oddly enough, I cried watching Olympus Has Fallen. I gave her the record. No other movie actually really makes me emotional, to be honest. I, yeah, I cried watching that movie. One movie that made me emotional was Bridge of Terabithia. Ooh. Oh yeah, I remember. But I think okay, were... there's one movie. Oh wait, you will never we watch it. You review and you told us that. Yeah, and of course, freaking Stanley posted a meme about that. <laughs> one movie oh, you'll never course. watch again. Of course, does. Yeah. It is called The Boy in the Strap Pajamas. You will never oh, see. Oh my god. That was. Fucking it's just sick seeing out. it through the eyes of a child and the question it. Okay, I, uh, I need to not cry right now, because... I don't want to talk about it. That is too yeah. sad. It's fucked up. <laughs> it was great until the end. That was fucked up. Oh, Lord. No, I was going to say, you want to see the freaking list of anime movies. I'm going to be going through the next several days. No, you don't want to see that one, though, Morgan. <laughs> don't. No, I mean, these are all the anime it's movies. It's more of a once scene thing, and then you're done. Yeah. It's one of those movies you just don't want to talk about, either. But a yeah, lot of people finished... said the Green Mile made them cry at the end, too. Mm. Have, you, guys, well, yeah. have you ever seen Where the Wild Things Are? I've actually yeah. not seen that, but I remember it being in theaters when I start was starting high school. It was good. It's, like, good for, like, kids' imagination, but there were some scenes in it that was not for kids. Like, there were some scenes in that movie that kids shouldn't watch, and it was like, uh at times, but it was good. Oh, well, Maurice Sendak himself, the author, he was, he was, a, he was a centric kind of author. So, I think yeah. the, the way the design and everything were, it was, it was faithful to the illustrations. They try to design the creatures the way the, the, they designed in the book. That was a thing, but a lot of people thought it was just creepy because how they looked. I'm like, well, it's on the story, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. People are so critical about everything. Well, obviously, if they want to criticize more of Maurice's material, they need to look at the ones where it involves an oven and a boy, and then a lot of people went after him, and it was like, how dare! It, they made comparisons to the Holocaust, but the thing is, he's a Holocaust survivor, so. I think he can do that. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. Crazy. And, he all, and a lot of people are like, well, why are the children naked? And I'm like, well, a lot of people, when they dream, they, they don't have any clothes. And in a way, that you, you come out naked, so, I mean... No, I dream clothes. That's what the frick it is to get that crap out of my head. It, it can depend on some people and how they dream. No, I could dream about the red Yeezy or the Yeezy Red Oxopers. <laughs> ben! Thanks for your puns! Oh my god, you're at level 100 finally. Think freaking Christ. Good Ben! Oh, okay. No, I'm just going to show this to YouTube because literally I watched this freaking film today and good God.
My name. Oh, cool. And it does have. Sp and it doesn't have spoilers, so watch the movie hey, yourself. Saber Totoro is directed by Hayao Miyazaki, and I just got to see this. It's also on gogoanime.com. <clears throat> in theaters. There's a really cool new thing going on this year called Ghibli Fest. Fathom Events is doing a special two-night-only run of various Studio Ghibli films, and Totoro was the first one they showed. It's a good excuse for me Jeez, to finally review it, because one of my goals for my channel is to have a review for every Studio Ghibli film ever made. At some point in the future, I'd oh, like to have that accomplished. It's going to take a while, trust me, but this year I'm going to try to knock all the ones they're showing at Ghibli Fest. Despite the fact that I know many of you have seen this movie, I'm also sure a lot of you haven't, so I'm going to avoid oh, spoilers the movie. in this review. Basically, it. it's about two young girls Disney and a father. Who move to a rural lot. countryside in a new house, and they explore the house, and they make up yeah, stories a, about the fact that they think it's haunted, and they use their imagination. They're the two very happy-go-lucky girls, and their mother is in the hospital. It's unclear exactly what she has. There are small hints given towards what me. their mother's illness might be, but it's never really clearly stated. And it's clear as an adult watching this movie oh. that these kids are using their imagination so much because they're trying to escape the fear that they have about whether or not their mother could die. And eventually the youngest girl, May, while her sister is at school, runs into a beast named Totoro in the forest. Now Totoro has a lot of magical abilities. He can make plants grow at will, in fact entire trees. He has a cat bus at his disposal that can basically take you anywhere yeah. that you want to go. And he can fly on a spinning nuts. top. Is he in the girl's imagination? Or is he real? Can he actually break through the real world? Or is he just an imaginary friend? One of my biggest fears, and I mean this for real, is that classic films will not be appreciated by new generations. I'm afraid that some of these great classic animations are going to be tossed aside by a new generation that just wants 3D, computer animation, and a lot of dance sequences in their animated films. That's not necessary and I was so to make a refreshed good and relieved to sit in this theater today surrounded by kids who were in awe at this movie. Normally, I'm annoyed when kids get really vocal during films, but here it was perfect. At all the right moments, kids were like, wow, oh, look, I see Totoro. Like, they were so into it. And I was so relieved to see that because this movie has none of the modern distractions of almost every kid's movie that's released today. There's no breathtaking action sequences. There's no explosions. It's not in 3D, and it's not computer animated. But the kids in this theater were transfixed by this movie. And so was I. It still works beautifully as an adult. The animation is just so damn good, and this movie is going to be timeless. Seeing it in theaters today and feeling the audience react at all the right moments, this movie is going to be around for a really long time, and I could not be happier because you now. it deserves to be. Hayao Miyazaki is just so freaking You now is high, man. I can't give this guy enough praise. And as I review the Studio Ghibli films throughout this year, you're going to hear this a lot, but I can't escape saying it. Their animations are just the best there is. I think they're the best in the entire industry. They've been around for so long, and I hope that they continue to make films in the future and that they can figure out a way to work out their financial issues because we need films like this that inspire children's imaginations, that can make adults think also about the film because you can look at this film and be like, hmm, for the first half of it, Totoro seems to appear when one of them is asleep. Does that mean that he's just in their dreams? But then as the film progresses, you can see that other things are happening while they're awake. So not only is the animation gorgeous and the characters a lot of fun, it's a film that actively uses your brain. You feel like you're engaged with the way it's cut together, with the direction, and you feel like you're using your imagination just like these kids are. It captures, I think, perfectly the carefree, adventurous feeling that so many kids have. The score, also, by Joe Hisaishi is one of his best. And, I mean, I, I'm saying things you've heard a billion times over and over again, but it has to be said, this animation is just so beautiful. It also sneaks up on you, because at one point the film gets a little serious. And I haven't seen this movie in a while, and I was surprised at how invested I actually got. Which tells oh, you did. just really what Miyazaki was doing in the first two acts of this movie, because yes you're experiencing a very fun and sort of light movie until you realize that you actually really care about these characters. And that's rare in animation. I'm going to give my neighbor Totoro a much deserved A+. Oh, their mother was sick Thank because... Thank you so much, guys, for watching. I'm going to try to see... The quality every of the animation of it was so good. Stephanie, what's happening? Show. Yes, Samurai Jack Season 5 gave me everything I wanted. It was so... Oh, thank you, Tiffany. Okay.
Yeah, I'm just showing you the other one that I actually binged through all today. Now I aren't in the studio together, which is going to do this whole thing voice only. So this is only temporary. We apologize, but we thought you guys, while you're sitting at home, need some content. You also need films to watch. And we are here to talk about a particularly interesting one with Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. So yep. Andy, give us a rundown of what is it's Nausicaa of, of the down. Valley of the Wind all about. Norska in the Valley of the Wind is about a young girl called Norska, um, who there's like the world's been ravaged and kind of like uh, bugs. These kind of bugs are taking over. There's like toxic wasteland everywhere. There's little little kind of things of cities that kind of like some are at war, some are like trying to live peacefully. And it's studio. Well, it's kind of Studio Ghibli, uh, but this was actually made before. Damn it! Could there be a better review of this film? Oh God. Hey, anyway, let's screw it. Every year, Fathom Events and G-Kids throw a year-long Ghibli Fest in cinemas across the country, re-releasing a one-beloved Studio Ghibli film into theaters for a two-night event every month. And while this year's Ghibli Fest is already underway, I plan on doing a review video for each animated movie that's released from here on out. I'm also I already currently missed House Movie these. Castle in April, so I'll cover that another time. But it does seem more appropriate to begin with this month's film, since it's considered by many to be the very first one, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. First released in Japan in 1984, legendary animator Hayao Miyazaki only had one other feature film under his belt as director, Lupin III, The Castle of Cagliostro in 1979, yep. a film that grew to have a cult following over the years, but at the time, the movie was just the latest installment of an already popular franchise. Nausicaa was the very first movie for Miyazaki of where he had full creative control over the project, since it was based off of his own manga of the same name. So the story and the characters were completely his own. In a post-apocalyptic future, the world has been overrun by giant insects and a jungle infested with poisonous fumes that could drive the remains of humanity to extinction if they inhale too much of it. But there is one area where the grass is still green and the air is still pure, called the Valley of the Wind, where the Princess Nausicaa leads her people to peace and harmony by isolating themselves from the rest of the war-stricken world and spends more time trying to study the toxic jungle rather than destroy it. But the other kingdoms have different plans and end up bringing their wars to the valley's doorstep. So Nausicaa does everything she can to make the other kingdoms see reason and help them to avoid repeating humanity's past mistakes. This movie was only the beginning of what would become a legendary career for Miyazaki. And over the years, his talents and his library of films have greatly improved. And as much as I love the rest of Ghibli's library, is it strange to say that this one might actually be my personal favorite? Sure, many of Ghibli's later movies were improved in terms of quality, but for some strange reason, I feel myself drawn to this one more than the rest. To me, I just find this futuristic world really fascinating. The whole mythological lore is given to us in bits and pieces, leaving enough gaps in its history for the audience to connect the rest of the dots for themselves. The landscapes are also impressive to look at. This world is just so massive that it feels like an animated cinematic epic, like The Lord of the Rings, or Star Wars, or Lawrence of Arabia. So for that reason, I am highly recommending that you see this movie on the big screen if you ever get the chance. Small screens don't really do it justice, especially for a it first view. It did for me because I had no Nazca choice. herself is a fascinating character as well. She is easily on my top ten list of the most beautiful animated women of all time. I just find her ambition, her spirit, and compassion really attractive. She knows when to be kind and nurturing, but at the same time, she has her limits. And there are moments where her emotions get the best of her. So you can't argue that she's perfect. She does make mistakes, but she learns from them. Plus, having Alison Lohman voice the character is enough to make any guy go soft. There's nothing to fear. <laughs> nothing to fear. <laughs> this doesn't even Nothing affect her. She's so calm about it. Right? Well, just... Yeah. <laughs> I was watching the movie. Oh, like, dark times. Geez. 
Another Aww. thing that I love about this movie is the use of silent moments. No voices, no music, just the natural sounds you know what? of the I'm wind, my or family no sound at all, are enough to create heart-stopping tension. Although my mom might, might be weirded out by it. <laughs> This is 1984 anime. My mom head. is weird like now. Like gonna... anime for... They <laughs> have noses. Yes, another village. Most people get weirded that. out because they ain't got noses. I'm not going to noses. argue that the movie is flawless, though. It's <laughs> clearly a, not. A sad there thing. are a couple of gripes I have. No, noses are parts bigger than I think music was really necessary. Don't get me wrong. The music is great, and there are several scenes that use it very well. But there are moments where I found the music distracting and wish it was just another suspenseful silent moment. Another nitpick I have is that some moments feel rushed, but I get why. This movie basically covers only the first two volumes of the manga. Some things would yep. have to get cut in order to keep the film to a two hour running time. So yeah, there are some minor flaws, but for only Miyazaki's second movie, and for it to hold up after all these years, oh, and yeah, this bad. film is incredible, side I use. and it makes me overlook its issues. Get a pop of bad blocker. So like I said, whether it's for one of the points I that mean. I've already listed, <laughs> or I can't afford it. I have yet to discover and analyze. No, you can find one free in Google Chrome's extensions. I'm mailing you Firefox. So enjoy Spirited Away, Fox, Princess Mononoke, Fire, and extensions. My Neighbor Totoro. But I'm certain that I will How be to coming back to Nausicaa more often than the rest. This would be new. I'm going to give really Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind four and a half stars. Guys, thank you so much for watching my video and stay tuned for my next Ghibli review for Whisper of the Heart. Ah, uh, you have too many of these movies to well, watch. Well, there's some, it's on a streaming service somewhere. I think it might be, hold up. I know that almost a lot of Studio Ghibli's movies are on HBO Max. I just we had might to get still from... ha yeah, I think we have HBO Max actually. Well, I had to use my site because yeah, you know, I don't have HBO Max anymore. <laughs> and the audio is match. I mean, Tiffany, I've had stupid luck finding mine. Weirdly oh. enough. Okay, how many more Studio Ghibli movies I have to watch? Oh, no. Well, okay then. Why are you watching so many? Because they're good movies. Too damn good. Well, I'm skipping out the... I'm skipping out the Palm Poco one because, uh... Oh, wait a minute, I forgot, hold on! Let's just say Tiffany, they glide with their... Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, literally, this is like the freaking whole extensive list. Going from Nausicaa Valley okay. of the Wind. There was this the way... cartoon in Germany about a cat. May it was. It's based on a German, German Turkish writer, and it is weird. Fella, oh God, we ain't watching that on here. You've heard of it? I watched the damn reviews, oh. Heather. I've seen clips of that movie, and I'm scarred for life because of it. Well, more scarred than usual, but yeah. A novel of cats and murder. <laughs> what was the awful and, and way too much damn boinking. Yeah. Some movies too. What the? No, that's the PG version of how I'm going to describe it. It's okay. I, I saw the reviews, too. Hell, I watch Bob Sh Shock's like freaking. Well, also in movie, Germany, uh, anything, no censors are different there. Wait, all I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Let me see. Ocean yes. Waves. Have you seen that one? 
I... I kid you not, Dustin. I watched the history of all these, and literally... Hmm. Aside from clips, I have not fully watched these, aside from Nausicaa Valley, The Wind, and... Well, my neighbor Totoro, of course. Hmm. They got Castle in the Sky, which I think that's the next one I'm watching. Grave of the Fireflies, which I probably may not only because of... It's the World War II film, and... The keys delivery service, which is also my list. Never really heard of only yesterday. Porco Rosso, maybe. Don't know about ocean waves. I'm not watching that because they fly with their. Yeah. Whisper of a heartbeat in my watch? <laughs> Princess Mononoke might actually be on my list. If I can find the freaking dub for it. But yeah. Actually, let me find a clip. Princess Mononoke, duh. Wait, oh, I gotta filter out the freaking movies. Uh, oh. Yes, I found the dub. Saving it. Damn it, log. Typing with long nails is a little. Well, I always protect the nails. <laughs> Tales of a Princess. If you hear voices, it's people on GTA talking shit. Yeah, it's alright. You can talk shizen. Great, I'm back up to 100,000 bars. I took away 50,000 bars for me to get 500 bars. So, I mean, 50,000 diamonds in order to get 6,000 bars, so yeah. I wish I had 50,000 bars. If I had 50,000 bars, I'd be even happen it to give you 120 likes. 120k likes. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, this one was their worst one, actually. Because <laughs> get this, it wasn't directed by Hayao Miyazaki, it was directed by his son. And, yeah, it does. So you heard of the Raspberry Awards, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Japan has their own version of that, and he got ones for worst director and worst picture. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, way to hand it to your son, Dad. Well, I'm trying to find the most popular ones, at least for now, until... I know Japan, like, anime is, like, based in Japan. I wonder if Korea has their own, like, animation stuff. They do, Dustin, but at times it looks severely low budget. They do, but it's not as good as Japanese. Dude, uh, they even got their own rip-offs of freaking Batman. <laughs> Damn. I don't even think I ever show you the Golden Bat video because it does kind of go into Korean makes of that. Imagine if China making their own animation. <laughs> oh, great. That's he goes by like many that. names. In Italy, they call him Fantamon. This in is Japan, actually good. My mom likes it. And in Japan, they simply call him the Golden Bat. Oh. Today's anime is about a skeleton wearing a cape. <laughs> probably I'm one good. of the most important characters that you've never heard of. Literally, one of the oldest superheroes. So period. in this video, I'm going to cover every single aspect of Golden Bat, and even stuff that Wikipedia doesn't know about. So with that said, let's start with the anime. Released in 1967, Golden Bat is a TV series about a group of kids traveling the Earth under the great Professor Yamatone. 
When he's not inventing rocket fuel or solving world hunger, he's traveling the planet in his flying supercar. Every episode, him and his group of kids travel the world, but in the first episode, it's all about this giant monster that's appeared somewhere off the coast of Antarctica. A ship has set sail for the lost city of Atlantis, but as soon as they get close, they get attacked this by a sea monster, leaving Astro a young Boy girl animation. as the sole survivor. Picking up the distress signal, a UFO flies in and rescues her, but no sooner do they escape, they end up crash landing on the lost city of Atlantis. It's there that they discover a gold sarcophagus, and using the research that her father left her, the young girl revives the greatest hero who has ever lived. And thus, Golden Bat awakens from his 10,000 year sleep to fight for justice and save the world from evil. And from then on, the show has these kids bumping into monsters, solving mysteries, and slowly building towards fights with the superhero Golden Bat. Thankfully, they don't call on him unless they absolutely have to. And this is kind of important because Golden so Bat Captain is one Point of the most okay. invincible characters that I have ever seen. You can't freeze him. He doesn't mind if you light him on fire. And I'm pretty sure he summoned a tornado one time. Also, he can tell uh, he said he might come back basically yeah, magic. In a few As hours a skeleton if you magician busy. from beyond time and space, Golden Bat's power level might. is only limited by your imagination and how fast they could draw it. I give Half it a hard in my head what kind of crazy I that well. thing that he'll fight next. This was right okay, in the well, middle of the late 1960s that. kaiju boom. No, they're so not. Fought as many creatures as skeletons. I don't as remember. It's not the fact that he has all? every power Why imaginable I that. I dreamt that I met and talked with Harvey Keitel about life and stuff. Honestly, my dreams are weirder than that. It's just a bunch of animals. He's an actor. Basically. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know who he is. I'm just saying my dreams are kind of basically me either meeting the nostalgic or the angry video game nerd or hot anime chicks on a beach or something. I love about him, it's how he actually fights. Yeah. Most heroes have a catchphrase, but he does things a little bit different. Instead, he'll just laugh in your face and throw an entire building at you. <laughs> All these monsters are being thrown at him well, yeah, by the great Dr. You, Nazo, kids. one of the most evil supervillains <laughs> of all time. I absolutely love this guy. He's half scientist, half UFO, and 100% evil. He puts the mad in mad scientists. When I think of OG supervillains, I think of Dr. Nazo. He once stole all the water in a river just so he could steal all the gold at the bottom of it. Another time, he forced a village Makes to build him a giant robot, only to turn them to oh, dust when it. they finished. He's the kind of guy that doesn't wash his hands when he goes to the bathroom. Not because one of his hands is a giant claw, but because he's just that evil. Most villains would have some sort of volcano lair or something, not Nazo. He went one step further and made his entire base portable, just so he could be evil wherever he wants. It also doubles as a rocket ship, because why wouldn't it? The stories range from battles Rocky with Greek ship gods to episodes about cone. science gone mad. One story, Nazo steals some kind of rocket fuel. Another episode, the kids are exploring distant magical lands. It's got a good balance of adventure and monster fights. Now, even though it never aired in America, people all around the world still remember this show very well, and someone at Cartoon Network was probably a huge fan. Lapis Lazuli from Steven Universe looks a lot like a character from yeah, episode 20. Yeah, all this is hardcore that story Steven an Universe kingdom I with a magic never world get at the center. Universe. When Dr. Nazo finds out about its unimaginable I've, power I and hires it. fish people to steal a it lot. with giant monsters but and science mega magic. Golden Bat then proceeds to beat them so hard into the ground that they turn back into regular fish. And this isn't even the first time Steven Universe referenced this series either. Dr. Nazo has a second in command. Oh my command. gosh. He's pretty much the only person who doesn't get turned very into funny. a pile of dust by some sort of science laser beam. And he looks oh, a lot... Oh, the... I got a question, this because of all the times I've watched this video and literally... And this isn't even the first time Steven Universe referenced this series either. Dr. Nazo has a second in command who's pretty much the only person that doesn't get turned... Homie got that big ass antenna on that watch. What the frick you need that for? Turned into a pile of dust by some sort Hell of science no. laser beam, and he looks a lot like Apple Watch 1960. This other character from Steven Universe 2. <laughs> I don't think they've ever said it officially, but this is the same cartoon that parodied 1970s anime Captain Harlock. So I think what? somebody out there must no. really love this show. How no. they actually managed to watch it is anyone's guess. 
This series never came out in America, and the English dub is almost completely lost media. The only bit that survived is a few seconds that somebody managed to record onto a cassette tape in the 1970s. Now even though Gold and Bad is pretty popular, he hasn't had an anime series since the 1960s. But that doesn't okay, mean if I find the whole series, I don't care if I gotta redub this whole thing in myself. In the early 2000s, a video started circulating the internet for an anime called Golden Bat Millennium Version, but nobody really knows where it comes from. Was it a pilot for an unproduced series? Was it some sort of anniversary video? The, the whole thing is a complete awesome. mystery. At the bottom of the video, you can see some VHS data, so this is probably a preview at the end of some tape. The earliest reference that I can find is from 2003, on a release list for upcoming anime for that year. That same site claims that it was directed by Shinichi Watanabe, which would be pretty cool if it's true. He was the director of Excel Saga, and in fact, he worked on an episode of the anime Zetai Karin Children, and in that show, there's a very brief reference to Golden Bat. It's a shame nothing came of it, but hey, you know, what can you do? Thankfully, there is one piece of Golden Bat media that we actually can watch. In 1966, one year before the series, a live-action movie simply titled Golden Bat was released by Toei. It actually stars future okay, mid-1970s martial arts megastar Sonny Chiba, and it's just as great as it is goofy. <laughs> In this movie, the planet Icarus is careening towards Earth, and it's up to Professor Yamatone and the Pearl Research Lab to figure out how to blow it up. Meanwhile, the planet's impact is accelerated by Dr. Nazo, who's actually an alien from outer space this time. In the anime, they could just have You're Golden still here, whatever hockey, they what wanted. Up? But in the movie, he's trained in the mystical art of beating yeah, people he's... up with a stick. They had the actor wear a rubber mask, and it makes him sound nice. even spookier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the gas off! Every time I see his face, I can't help but smile. The whole movie has this sincere goofiness that you just don't see anymore. After that, Golden Bat gives them the materials for the lens that they need to blow up the meteor that's heading towards Earth, and then the film turns into a spy movie. Hey, you know, it was the 1960s. It was like half the movies out were spy movies. And then you throw in some kidnapping, a hijacked spaceship, and Golden Bat's classic laughing in the face of evil. You've got a pretty good fun B movie. Toei probably made this thing just to cash in on Ultraman, which aired just a couple of months earlier. And when the movie came out in Italy, they renamed it Diabolic, which makes this his fifth name if we're counting Latin America. Over there, they call him Fantasmagorico. That's probably why you never heard of this character. Nobody knows his name! Now, the movie is pretty famous in its own right, but would you believe that the character goes back even further than the 1960s? Golden Bat has so much lost media that it borders on archaeology. Not only is he Japan's first superhero, he might be the first tokusatsu hero, too. Predating the movie Supergiant by seven years and Godzilla by four, the first Golden Bat film came out in 1950. Made by Shin Egasha and distributed by Toei, Japan's first superhero movie was called Golden Bat, Phantom of the Skyscraper. Now, unfortunately, no copies of this movie still exist, but through newspaper clippings and some insane research, I've pieced together everything that... And this is why the hell we need time travel to exist so I can steal the real. I know about it. Apparently, the plot involved Dr. Nazo and his QX gang trying to steal a new atomic energy source, and that's all we really know about it. It ends with Golden Bat saving the day, and that's all we know. It's a shame it's lost media because Japan's entire masked hero genre starts with this one film. He's got the cape. He's got the mask. He fought villains with superpowers. I would say it counts. And yeah, I know Wikipedia says Supergiant was Japan's first superhero movie, but that's probably wrong. I mean, technically, there's proto-toku stuff from before 1950, but it's all pretty much ninja movies, and nobody's ever taken a photograph of a ninja, so we'll just never know. But that Kenny, you say, change. that doesn't make Golden Bat Japan's first superhero. I've seen every Japanese movie there is, and there's tons of characters that come before him. Well, this is to go back even further beyond. Predating Superman, Batman, an anime as we know it. Golden Bat's first known appearance can be tracked back all the way to 1931. That makes him not only Japan's very first superhero, but one of the oldest heroes worldwide. Back then, manga yep. barely even existed. 
so instead they told stories with the Japanese art of Kami Shibai. Translated as paper theater, these slideshows laid the groundwork for the manga that we know and love today. You'd run out a stand, narrate a story, and gather a crowd of people by making some kind of sound. Nice. That's the sound. It was kind of like an ice cream truck, but instead of ice cream, it was the fantastic stories of golden bats. Performers would do all sorts of voices, and at the end everyone got candy, Took which Jacob automatically French. makes it better than anime. So yes, Japan used to lure in children with stories of talking skeletons and candy bars, but that doesn't make it any less a Damn, I want accurate. free candy! In fact, it's actually still being practiced today. Check out this modern version that I found where they projected the anime on top of it. Hey, if you're not into Japanese shadow puppet theater, then you know, I don't know what to tell you. You just need to get on my level. I'd like to think someone who saw the anime as it was airing in the 1960s once. Eh, you know, the Kami Shibai was better. Yeah, anime is technically remarkable, what with bringing moving pictures to life and all. But where's the heart? You don't even get candy for watching? Anime blows. Early on, people mocked TV in Japan by calling it electric Kami Shibai. Because really, why would you pay for a TV when you could watch Golden Bat for free? Now, I don't really consider it to be manga, but they still do shows at the Kyoto Manga Museum. And who am I to argue with all of Japan, right? They were even kind enough to subtitle it too, which makes Golden Bat not only Japan's first superhero, but the first subtitled manga too. What, you guys don't watch your manga subtitled? This is probably the only time you could ever say that and be 100% right. Now, would you believe, and this is where it starts getting really, really obscure, would you believe that there's actually another Golden Bat movie based on all of this madness? In 1972, Toho released a comedy about the origins of Golden Bat called The Golden Bat Is Here. And despite being made by a major company like Toho, this movie is lost media too. The only footage I could even find is a two minute clip that somebody probably recorded onto a VHS tape when it was airing on TV in Japan. And the fact that there's not one but two lost Golden Bat films kind of amazes me. And now we get into the really, really obscure stuff. This wasn't even the last time that they tried to reinvent Golden Bat, let alone the final time that they tried to reinvent the character. Released in 2005, Garo is a live action gothic horror series with costumes, fighting, and so many sequels that I can't possibly cover them all. So I'm, I'm not, not even gonna bring lie, it up I'd then, watch right? this. Well, it looks like the project started with the name Skull Z very, very early on. Originally, Keita Amamiya, creator of the series, began the project with a simple idea. What if Golden Bat was remade with modern technology and a brand new design? So he drafted up some characters, but as the design evolved, he resembled Golden Bat less and less. Time passed, and eventually they settled on a wolf theme instead, and, well, you know, the rest is history. He never got that modern show, but everything from the skulls to the gold hero carried over into the final product. So in a way, his spirit lives on, even if most people don't realize it. My favorite design doesn't even come from a show. Japanese publication Out Magazine did a joke issue with fake Gundam designs, and one of them had Golden Bat redesigned as a metal hero mecha. I love this picture so much. Now, Golden Bat is well-loved around the world, but there is one place that takes their love of this series to an entirely different level. I didn't mention it before, but the series was one of the first anime to outsource some of its production to South Korea. This excluded it from their ban on Japanese media at the time. And there and you go, Dustin. It really popular over there. They like him so much, they even made no, their own movies. Yeah, now, I'm not going to Kind of as close as Korean anime as you get. Bat fighting a Wait, a like Korean anime? Which just might be the best thing that I I've ever seen. Korean, Korean anime was him Avatar so much that it's kind of hard to tell where one series ends and another that begins. You've heard of... Uh, I mean, that's more American, actually. Well, I think it was. I've heard that it was influenced by Korean anime. Or probably anime in general. The anime. You've heard of the movie, but have you heard of Golden Bat Man? It's a South Korean cartoon from 1979. I where they dig this. Golden Bat and Batman. Into this a is what I was character. talking about. This thing was apparently popular <laughs> enough. That it led to a live action ripoff in 1990 called Super Beta Man. That's right. Korea loves this series so much that even their bootlegs have bootlegs. 
The amount of ripple effect that this character had on all hero media is kind of insane. Uh, Even one of Osamu Tezuka's very no, first Steve, manga starred out. Golden Bat. Everything from TV to movies has his fingerprints on it, and I can't even imagine what anime would be like if he didn't exist. You ever hear of the anime Space Adventure Cobra? The main villain, yep. Crystal Bowie, was probably influenced by this series. He's got a golden skeleton, and he also has Dr. Nazo's claw. I'd say it counts. Ever hear of this obscure show called Power Rangers? Well, the second episode has a team of heroes fighting a monster that looks a lot like Golden Bat. It's kind of hard to tell in the episode, but it's actually based on his 1930s musketeer design. Okay, now here's a real obscure one. Have you ever played the Sega Genesis game Trouble Shooter? It's a side-scrolling shmup with two anime girls, and one of the bosses looks just like Dr. Nazo. He even has the claws and the four eyeballs. Oh, and in case you were wondering where you've seen him before, he also shows up for a second in Gainax's Daikon 4 short. Golden Bat has been on Japanese stamps, modern cartoons are still referencing him, and he even had a series of bubblegum, which I'm sure would break all your teeth if you tried to eat it today. I don't think you could find a more important Sub character DJ if you tried. P. Sadly, most people Way just don't Lester. know about him, and I would pay for somebody to re-release this model kit where he rises from his sarcophagus. If he Even his rim. toys have history. This thing was so cool that it actually showed up in the Gainax anime Otaku no Video next to a model kit for Minky Momo. And if that doesn't cement him as one of the greatest anime characters of all time, then I don't know what does. Next year marks his 90th anniversary, but it's anyone's guess if we'll ever see him again. Flying through space and time alone, will Golden Bat ever laugh in Evil's face ever again? I'll tell you one thing, that's a secret that only the bats know. Yeah, good luck of anyone trying to find that thing. Seriously, does that doodle not look like something from Adventure Time? Uh, it kind of uh, does. But I was going to say, Heather, believe me, I'm best friends with an Adventure Time expert and literally who loves Marceline and bubblegum being together to death. It actually looks like one of those uh, demon figurines when they were going to see Marceline's dad. Jesus Christ, he's all... Well... <laughs> that was before COVID, by the way. God damn it. Yeah, it hasn't been updated. Yeah, Henry really doesn't update his Instagram. No, that's his assistant. Yeah. She... They, well, she's been his assistant for like 20 years and they have and she's married with children but she's basically the office wife interesting continue but I swear it looked like something from Adventure Time I'm trying to think of a Kenny Lauderdale video I haven't shown anyone but I swear to god <laughs> I watched his whole damn channel Kenny, you need more content, damn it. I love your videos. Uh, uh, wait, I might have. Nah, I've shown Space Family Call of Ugh. Okay, I'm trying to figure out what is something that's anime related that I remember seeing. No, I've shown the Charge Man Ken. No, I've showed Dragon Ship. Yeah, I've shown things that aren't anime. May not be anime. Yeah, I've shown the freaking ripoff of Nausicaa. Which I swear to God, this is the thing that made me want to watch Nausicaa. Like, what in the freak? Oh, wait, I never showed you this, Heather, I think. So I School girl delinquent shows. Yes, this is a I've thing. I've been wanting to talk about it don't shock show me. for a while now, but it's been so full I of wish it was dubbed. school girls fighting evil yes. costumes. It's I don't really know how to bring it up. 
that was around half a year ago. So I think it's Mail, about time I everyone. go American ahead TV and fix that. TV just gets that. boring at Today we're going to be talking about the Sailor Suits Rebel Alliance, a show where girls with dark pasts and secrets bravely stand up to evil. Sailor Suits Rebel Alliance is a show that even fans of the Sukeban genre really just don't talk about that much these days. Released in 1987, idol-based dramas were at their... Well, obviously, it looks very 80s, the you hair. Hana no Asuka Gumi, the show where a girl fights with a solid gold coin, Captain America style. You had, obviously, Sukeban Deka, where a detective girl fights people with a yo-yo, and so on and so forth. Basically, at this time, Japanese TV was nothing but girls in sailor uniforms fighting evil with crazy, crazy weapons. Now I could pretend that the story in this show makes a little sense, but you know, even the series itself just kind of forgets what it's about right after the first episode, and you really get no answers, so just roll with it. All you need to know is the main character was attacked with a butcher knife by her mother when she was a child, and the people who took her away had a symbol for a school filled with the most undesirable troublemakers that you could possibly think of. In the past, Blackbird Academy was a prestigious school for students with bright futures, but now parents just throw their lazy kids in there with the promise that they will be reformed for a huge, huge enrollment fee. Unsurprisingly, every single character is some kind of delinquent, so when Yumi makes her entrance on a helicopter, well, they let her in because she's probably loaded. Being a grade-A student is usually a good thing yeah, I'm at a school, but uh, at this place it gets you attacked by every single person in class. Lucky for her, that butcher knife scar on her chest just kind of makes people back off, but they're kind of too oh, busy okay, messing after this, with found you to, to pay any attention to her anyway. It's the nerd pretty much uh, reacting to Power Rangers and its whole history. Which, yes, that too started in Japan. He's the second central character of the show. Oh, since 1975, may I add. And literally, the 90s show came out, they had stock footage from Super Sentai, kept doing this all the way to this day, and I bet they're still doing it. Oh, who gets beaten up in a bunch of the stories, and he really doesn't deserve it either. He's pretty much the only person there trying to actually learn anything. Yo, Mark, then what up, man? Then we have the people oh, at the head of the school. <clears throat> The principal oh, is a former Yakuza running the place into the ground. And oh, once a year, he has a school assembly just so he can remind the students no, how was bad the they <laughs> messed up. <laughs> the gym no, teacher isn't no. much better. The sound of his kendo stick is so loud you can barely understand also, Mark him. Is my and I'm pretty sure name. he's just a student that got held back so many times that he never graduated. It's the kind of what? place where you don't know how bad you've messed the hell up with until that? they I throw you in behind bars. Forever. Not because you would end up in prison if your grades don't improve, but because they have a jail built right into the school. Now, it doesn't take an undercover the tax detective went. with the yo-yo <laughs> to figure out that things are not yeah. as they seem. So when Yumi sneaks in at night looking for some answers as to why this place is so messed up, she bumps into two other girls who are doing the exact same thing. Together, they form the Sailor Suits Rebel Alliance. Students by day, vigilantes by night. The idea is they're so decked the out in makeup that nobody changed. can tell who they really are. Just like all the other shows in this genre, every girl has a different household object to fight with. Ruri uses steel pencils as throwing darts that always magically hit people's hands. Yumi has gloves for punching forgiveness and understanding into people's faces. And Kay has my favorite weapon of all, a scarf. Not your typical, average, everyday scarf. One that doubles as a chain to tie people up. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's ten feet long. They really didn't care. It changes from scene to scene, so they get pretty creative with it. Most episodes are centered around these teachers and all the horrible things that they do. But one of them isn't even about the school. It's about the janitor that works there. They trick him into delivering a package full of money. And when it gets stolen, he's so grief-stricken with what happened that he offs himself in order to maintain a little bit of dignity. The rest of that episode Blech. is a ghost story about how the spirit of the school janitor is haunting people, so that gives you just a tiny idea of what this show is like. Another good one is about a beautiful English teacher that substitutes one day. 
All the students are trying to impress her, so you get a bunch of scenes where they're cleaning the school, trying to get on her good side. Really funny stuff. But when she's not teaching class, she's trying to figure out who the real sailor suit Hangyaku Dome are. And I think she was just hired by the principal to do all this or something. Honestly, it doesn't really matter why she's there. But for some crazy reason, they fight her in the middle of an empty swimming pool, and they don't even pretend any of this is normal. She just twirls around like a magical girl, and then all of a sudden she's got a costume on. It's amazing. They wrap it up by showing the fallout of the fight, and I'm pretty sure the girls packed her into a shipping crate, thinking that they could mail her back to America or something. It's kind of a what theme with this show, the but episode four hell? has another completely different evil English teacher as the main villain. And the thing about this guy, besides his gigantic afro, is he's blind. So you would think that they would go easy on him, but as soon as class starts, they throw knives at him, which he immediately knocks out of the air with his skull-shaped walking stick. Again, the kids at this school are probably here for a reason. So they introduce this guy, and you know something's up. But nothing really strange happens until later on. Once the school day ends, people start getting mysterious phone calls in the middle of the night. And the second that people respond, they immediately attack their parents. What in the hell? Damn, that's some hypnosis. It turns out that this guy has mind control poetry powers and is instantly turning people into violent criminals when he calls. So now you've got the girls having no idea what's going on. People are getting attacked on the news. Things are nuts. But Yuta gets a phone call in some broken English and, you know, well, they kind of just put two and two together. He tells them that he wore headphones in class on his 1980s Walkman, which made him completely immune to the hypnosis poetry. But when the girls call the meeting off, he gets attacked in person in the street instead. <laughs> Lucky for him, he snaps right out of it right before that happens. But the show swaps to a fight in the middle of the woods set to organ music and J-pop. And it turns out he was never blind in the first place. Shocker, I know, big surprise. So it takes the entire Sailor Suit hey, Rebel Curry. Alliance to take him down, and Watch they end up hanging him on a cross. This is generally hey, how Curry, most of the episodes go. The down? whole show is just nuts like this. You've got mysterious teachers doing shady things. The girls, they do some detective work to figure out what's going on. And then they give you some of that sweet night. You got power where you're at, Curry? Justice to top it off. Now, normally, I would say just skip to the end of the episode so you can see the fighting, but that would probably be doing this series a huge disservice. And I mean, sure, it's got scientists, mad scientists, attacking people with yeah, all sorts of powered. gases and stuff. And every Still once in a while, cold. you got a person ripped apart with motorcycles. But most of the stories are so good, they make you forget that all these we crazy all power, things are happening. Take episode 9, for example. But we're going to get another system. Yuta trying to send his friends a message on his computer. By Thursday or Friday. Suddenly, he intercepts a love no, letter. No, we lose power. I've, I'm in pitch black school. darkness sitting at his desk and tripping over crap to get out. Notes to try and figure out his identity, but they're so slow and have no idea where he'll strike next that people just start disappearing. The whole thing is super tense and has some genuinely Ooh. spooky moments. It almost feels like a slasher yeah, the meat movie at times. Sukeban Deka sounds like this. I wish it but was Sailor dumped. Suit's Rebel Alliance sounds like oh. this. I still wish this was dubbed. Now yeah, most of you needed. probably have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about by now. But for clarity's sake, this is what people like to call a J-drama. They're the staple of Japanese television, and Still, most of the time they're pretty there's standard. There's enough for an audience uh, to watch with this show, it. though, they, uh, they change things up a little. No, here's the thing. Funimation. 
Quit releasing Dragon Ball Z merch and freaking dub this stuff. Let me try and be a little bit more specific. Since quit dubbing this was more one piece, quit dubbing drama, everything else they that's couldn't mainstream. exactly have a monster of the week like it was. Give my hero academia a break. Common Rider or something. Lord. So instead, they had a celebrity be the big evil bad guy in about half of the stories. This leads to some hilarious episodes with fights <coughs> that make absolutely no sense. None at all. One of them is about Yakuza loan sharks trying to squeeze money out of the students. And you know, that's not all that crazy, right? They don't have any powers. They don't have any weapons. They're just basically businessmen roughing people up. But when it comes to the fight at the end, the main bad guy suddenly turns into a football player with a knife on his head. Then, an entire team of other football players suddenly pops out of nowhere, and it's just never explained. They they set, like, nothing, none of this up. It's like normal, normal, normal insanity. I thought I might have been losing it, so I went and looked up who this guy was. And suddenly, the football players just made a tiny bit more sense. Takashi's cast supposed to be around children, but uh, I may live next door to you. The TV show Takeshi's Castle aired five yeah. months later, so if you've seen Most Extreme Elimination Challenge, I probably have your attention. Right, you are, Ken. Good stuff. Even the people who sing the theme song to the show got in on the action. One of them shows up as a villain for some reason, and they have wind powers just basically out of nowhere. Or the force. Way more obvious. One thing that I found out that was pretty interesting to me anyway is these guys are the Japanese musical group Ah Jari who show up and do the theme song for another series that you may have heard of called Shoujo Commando Izumi where a girl with a rocket launcher fights you know, whatever, I've talked about that show enough. The point being is these shows are directly linked to one another, and if that weren't enough, even the stunt team that worked on one TV series ended up switching to the other. Oh, and in one episode, they fought Ultraman. But why all the crazy fighting, right? Not Aren't dramas so supposed to be, you know, dramas? To give a little bit more historical context, Sailor Suit's Rebel Alliance was made to compete directly with Sukeban Deka Season 3, which was being shown on a competing channel at the same time. This rivalry between the two shows was hey, such John. a big deal that they advertised hey, it like a prime time hey, wrestling match. Who would win? The Sailor Suit's Rebel Alliance and their endless fight against evil teachers, or Sukeban Deka Season 3? with their over-the-top ninja magic. I've said it before, but idol-based dramas were pretty much the norm at the time. You would find a pretty girl with a new album, and then use that popularity to generate some sales. Most of the cast went on to varying levels of success, but in this show, the main idol was barely in it. The celebrity that they were advertising this time was megastar pop idol Miho Nakayama. All the magazines act like she's the main character of the show, too, which is He's kind of really hilarious in retrospect. And I mean, sure, she is in the show, and she is a main character, but she doesn't have a costume until the finale. They write oh, this yeah, off by saying that she's the school chairman's daughter, meaning she can really only help from the shadows. Before Tuxedo Mask and Sailor Moon were even a thing, Miho was fighting evil oh with their exploding roses Oh my god, this is Tuxedo Mask! Generally, she pops up just as the girls are about to lose, and then wham, from out of a bush, she blinds them with the rose petals. Hey, the boy, Her lack of involvement in the plot was mostly due to scheduling issues. She was starring in another drama at the same time, but don't get too excited. It's just a regular show about regular people doing normal high school stuff. No people in crazy costumes drop-kicking motorcycles here. But both shows aired within three days of each other, meaning she was really just too busy to be on set most of the time. Part of that may have also had to do with her image as an idol. Not wanting to be typecast as a bad girl, they might have purposely limited her screen time so people didn't think she was a delinquent. This might also be why the show has so little merchandise. 
the unexpected success of the series kind of took them by surprise, and they didn't even make any video games for it. But why bother even making a game when people like Miho so much they'll buy anything with their face on it? A few months after the show finished airing, the video game companies Square and Nintendo made a school simulator called Miho Nakayama's Crush High School. I'd call it a dating simulator, but Miho is barely in this one too. They put her in as a and cameo, on a ran some commercials disc. with a hilariously oversized telephone, and they just called it a day. Reportedly, the whole thing only took two weeks to program, so that's probably why you've never heard of it. The way that they advertised the game is pretty interesting, too. It used the Famicom fax machine system to register people's save data, and then they had this huge contest with Miho to sell it. 8,000 lucky winners were sent a VHS tape if they could beat the game in time, and these videos are still prized as collector's items even today. Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of the Final Fantasy series, made the game, and it marks Nintendo uh. and Square's very first video game together way before Super Mario RPG came out in the 90s. Coincidentally, Final Fantasy came out a few weeks before this, so you could say the entire Sailor Suit Rebel Alliance is connected to it by only three levels of separation. Speaking of Wait, weird Nintendo trivia, one in two you guys in ever played Kid in Cool? Japan? You ever wonder why that video game is so bad? There couldn't have been that big a demand for Kid Cool. What was the hurry? Well, we finally have an answer because Kid Cool is in this show. He was a child actor what? known for dressing up as a baseball player and stars in one of the less good episodes. So if you ever wondered why that game is so bad, well, now you know. Another piece of deepest lore. Great, so this show has an angry video game nerd reference. Or about this show uh. is it actually has some manga. It was published as the series was airing, meaning the manga is based on the TV show and not the other way around. As far as trivia goes, if you've seen Kill a Kill, well, these white uniforms probably look pretty familiar to you now, don't they? Full disclaimer, this is kind of speculation on my part, so don't go updating any fan wikis. But if the creators of Kill a Kill saw Sukeban Deka and based the main character of that oh, series yeah, on that Sukeban is... show, then odds are they saw this Dead too. Ass, kill it's kind of hard to find Japanese TV ratings from 1986. For around 15% of Japan tuned in, making it one of the most popular dramas at the time. I was also really surprised to find out that the music from this show may have inspired the soundtrack to the anime Dragon's Heaven. Some of the music from that anime is suspiciously similar, so I'll let you make your own decision on that one. Take a listen. Oh my god, it is similar. The frick? So here's some cool info. You ever wonder what video games were for sale when they were making this thing? No? Well, too bad. I'm going to talk about it anyway. In episode 8, they have an arcade in the background, and you can just kind of sort of make out what video games they were playing at the time. The first video game is Hang On, and the second one is Enduro Racer. I'm not sure what this third one is, but I'm guessing the entire comment section is now furiously going over every screenshot on the internet to figure it out, so I look forward to finding out whatever this thing is. They also have yeah. these kids that are dressed up like Kuwabara wannabes trying to act cool later in the show. And one of the first things that they take from a store is the Fist of the North Star game oh. for the Sega Mark III. I dropped this now, you by can really only tell from the corner and of the one box, of the... But yep, that's it's rattling. Go Ken, all right. Sukeban shows oh, are yeah, something is... that I treasure, but that's what you call those girls who hide baseball bats on That was $10. The more accurate term would be sailor suited, idol driven, high school tokusatsu action dramas. Or, you know, yeah, just call them Sukeban shows. Japan theorized that if well, the shows had been downloaded, then eventually it there would be a high school girl band. from outer space. One that breathes like fire. Like I said, don't get ten dollar hate folks. Has all the powers of Ultraman and fights people with a shoulder mounted missile launcher. A few years later, we did get Shoujo Commando Izumi, so they probably weren't all that far off. 
Once again, I'd like to thank Tokyo for helping on me one make side. this video. Neither of us thought this would take half a year of research to put together, but we're both out of our minds, so everything kind of worked out fine in the end. As for me, there's still a few more of these shows that I'd like to cover, like that one about the pro golfer who beats people with golf clubs. And obviously, I gotta do reviews on each of those Sukaban deck shows, but then that's it. I'm definitely not doing future videos on Sailor Suit and Machine Gun, Sukaban Chainsaw, or any of the other delinquent schoolgirl shows. But hey, if this video gets enough likes, it'll start getting pushed out to people who don't even know what I'm talking about, which would be pretty funny. So if you want the chaos and confusion to continue, maybe leave a comment. Funny, because I'm like the rare 2% that does. Hey, do you. Yeah. I mean, it didn't do bad oh, yeah, damage. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we ought to let Steven know. We ought to let Steven know what's happening. And we gotta warn everybody, do not think of surfing in the goddamn no. tsunami. No! Turn around, don't drown! And if anyone's uh, lives get claimed by this and act like dumbasses and their family say it's my fault, yeah, guess what, not my fault. Oh, where's Steven? Oh, Steven. My question is, this tsunami get worse in other areas, but not here? I just wonder why. Any second now. Yeah, that ain't good. That's you with me. Why the frick you standing there? Yeah, everybody was like, um, you know you're supposed to leave. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it, it is kind of like, oh, like, okay, it's coming in, but... Don't, don't get me wrong, still film it, but run like hell. <laughs> yeah, you can run. That one that happened in 2004, it just, bam, it hit people and it didn't see them coming. <laughs> Riding a boat. Hell, if, I'd if steal it's, a boat. If it's a shallow enough boat. I'd still say the frick would didn't steal a boat. Okay, it's showing the tides when they slightly recede and then they start coming. That's kind of how a tsunami usually does. They recede back because something big is coming. And then, when it all is over, it recedes everything back into the ocean with it. Okay! That's well, flood that. waters! Then yeah, screw that. I steal the freaking car and then wind up using it as a boat. Here, I hit the curb! Are they? Damn, damn it, my freaking dream van is flooded. Mm. Or hell, even more stupider, I'd just be in the freaking trash can so it'd be Niagara Falls. Except going over the falls of the barrel. By the way, also, no one ever do that. Yeah, you'll drown. Especially because it's a freaking battle. It's just a slow moving tsunami. Damn it, I thought there would have been bigger waves that destroyed crap, but you can't. She's like, okay, just, let's just walk away from it and. There's cars floating in the uh, parking lot. Horns going off. Oh, look at this. Man. Man. Wow. <laughs> Shut up! Blame Ralph Nader. He's the one that reason that we have those alarms in the car. Yeah, no, that's to get the frick out of the damn, uh, get the frick out of their, uh, side. Oh, it's showing it received. Steal Fine. the house! Steal the house! Uh, it's already a house, but I think it can't take it. 
It's already got steel. Or not even better, break the stilts. I mean, hey, there anything you send in, I just always hope it explodes or something. Hey, get this. Oh, it's just got this guy leaning. People's yachts. Scream, get the fuck out the beach, god damn it, they're fucking snuffy. They're just calling it high tide. No, no, the one way to get people off the beach, shark. Works every time. I actually didn't see footage of the explosion though. Of the volcano erupting. Oh, that's going to be. Yeah, that's to get the fuck out of the damn harbor. Uh, wave six. Okay, I gotta see the explosion of that volcano in the Tonga. It was seen from space. Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and this, I think, is the biggest volcanic eruption I've ever seen viewed by a satellite. So, these are two images from geostationary satellites. On the left, we have Himawari 8. On the right, we have Goes West. And you don't need to look that hard to see this giant plume forming just as the sun sets over the eastern Pacific. It's actually from Tonga. It's, the place is called Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai. Uh, it's actually two separate islands which became one and then exploded in spectacular style, creating a dust cloud which is hundreds of kilometers across. I mean, this is like going from nothing to the size of a country in about, you know, an is hour. this a horror Krakatoa? Well, this is island the is uninhabited. Bad. There are lots of people living on islands nearby. Is if it you calls look close actually to the center there, that is the main it, island of Tonga with the capital there. It calls a 10-year winter. And we got a lot of images from the island as the eruption started. The skies got dark and eventually went black. And then the internet's gone out. So we're not really getting great communication from there. But so far I hear that there have been no fatalities, which is a good thing. The main effect on the rest of the world so far, however, has been a tsunami which spread around the Pacific. It uh, was much larger, obviously, to places nearby, but it came up to the U.S. west coast and it just happened to hit close to high tide. So places near me, like Santa Cruz, had serious water inundation. But obviously the most striking thing that we see from the satellite imagery is this massive plume of ash, which is hundreds of kilometers across. And it's... You know, the, the fact that it happened just around sunset meant that we, you know, you could really see the detail on those clouds. Uh, these were rising up to about 17 kilometers, 55,000 feet. This is the view from the U.S. satellite, but if we switch over to the Japanese satellite Himawari 8, you can see it from the other side. You can see it casting a shadow down, you know, towards away from the camera, so to speak. Again, these satellites, these are 36,000 kilometers away. They're designed for weather prediction. They can observe in 16 different frequency bands. And yeah, there's a lot of information that's no doubt coming out of these. But from what I can see, it's just a massively uh, impactful event for anybody that is living in that area. The worldwide effects aren't just the tsunami as well. If you look in this sequence, you can just about make out uh, like a sound wave, a pressure wave moving outwards. I think that's a pressure wave. 
It's moving at roughly the right speed. So this I specifically looked in the near infrared because that seemed to bring out the effects of the pressure. And that pressure wave has been tracked all the way around the world. Obviously, like nearby, people could hear it. Like in Fiji, 1,000 kilometers away, people could hear yeah. it. In New Zealand, 3,000 kilometers away, people could hear it. There are reports of people hearing it in Alaska. And of course, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, they have a network of microphones designed to detect nuclear tests, and they found it. I'm sure they will give, tell us just exactly how powerful this event was. But the pressure wave is sufficiently low frequency and deep enough to show up on just regular weather stations. This is the weather at uh, Half Moon Bay Airport showing it. And this is all the weather stations in Japan. And if you play the readings over time, you can see a pressure wave crossing the country. That scale, by the way, is hectopascals. One hectopascal is about one thousandth of the pressure uh, of sea at sea level. Similarly, in the US, you can oh, see wow. a pressure wave crossing towards the northeast, just taking uh, pressure data uh, at 15 minute intervals. In the immediate vicinity of the eruption, there's been something like I guess we'll have to wait a lightning see the effects from the plume. The lightning tracker networks. All that All right. heat, turbulence, dust, and water is a great way to generate those charge differences that let lightning happen. So this is obviously a very, very powerful event. It's very likely yeah, the energy released here odds. is many times that of the largest nuclear weapon the ever Krakatoa tested. Krakatoa event and was I'm not only sure what the illustrated. Will look like after this, but I know that if you go back 10 years or so, you actually have two separate islands, or basically islands on the rim of a caldera, which is sort of in the middle here. And yeah, about you know five, 10 years ago, we started to have eruptions that built up this island. And scientists from NASA actually spent a lot of time uh, studying this because from a geological standpoint, it was probably the best example of island building in recent times. So it was well documented and well covered by satellites. So the initial eruptions were between these two islands and they built up a spit of land between them. And normally they would have expected that to get slowly washed away by weathering and removed. But the action of the sea and the actions of the, the chemistry meant that it actually formed into like harder rock and it became a more permanent feature. This is what the islands looked like until recently. This is actually what Google Maps shows you if you browse there. Obviously, this is now out of date. It's worth noting that these islands are actually just on the top side of a much larger the submerged caldera. In the caldera. Ocean. So the actual volcano is much larger. Most of it is just submerged. And of course, all of this is fed by the melting of the Pacific plate as it subducts underneath the Australian plate. Yeah. Anyway, over the last few weeks, there have been a series of eruptions, and we can follow the changes in detail thanks to Planet Labs, who have, of course, a fleet of satellites that are able to observe the, uh, you know, the Earth, pretty much like Google Maps, but every 24 hours. So you can see the eruptions the built up plate, this which, area um, in between a whole lot more. And then on Friday the afternoon, there was a pretty crashes, serious eruption. Crashes. In fact, That's that eruption was in itself the, uh, visible thing from space. That... These are images by the Tonga Geological Service. They went out on a and then, boat and they saw the like, the, the the ash the rising to tens of thousands of feet. And after that settled down, Planet Labs Nothing got is another image destroyed, showing basically the middle of the island having largely That's been the play demolished. That's and this the is San just Andreas a couple fault. of hours before the really big eruption. So we don't know what's happened after this. But from geostationary orbit, we can see that uh, there's still a lot of clouds and you know dust and ash in the air. We also catch another eruption happening this morning, showing that the volcano is still very much active at this point. Uh, it's certainly not as big as the eruption on Friday or Saturday, and hopefully that means that things are subsiding and we're not going to expect another big blast like that. Like Long term, we are going to have to be so concerned about the amount of debris eight. and ash and everything that this is throwing into the atmosphere. This, you know... There have certainly well, been cases you're in the past California, where, you're not uh, large it. volcanic eruptions have affected the climate for a few years. The most recent and therefore most famous and well documented would be Mount Tambora, which erupted in 1815 and triggered the year without summer. Uh, you know, essentially the amount of dust that was through the, crack to the atmosphere, um, combined with you know, cold temperatures and nucleation, meant that you just had persistent low temperatures for a year. It caused at really yeah, low crop yields, which of course in turn change. led to famine and 
all sorts of other problems. I'm certainly not saying that this is anywhere close to this that scale of event. I don't actually know right now. All I know is that we saw it from space without even looking too hard, and that makes it an incredibly impressive event. And I'm hoping that people in immediate proximity are safe and sound. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Well, awesome. in California, there were four fishermen that were swept out to sea and they had to be rescued. Hey. Yeah. Damn. But yeah, because it's been a while since I kicked out my old quota of my favorite band on this show. But I swear to God, the songs were running through my head too much lately. Richard Vertigo? I also promised myself that if I wound up becoming famous and shit and wound up quitting entirely, this would be the very last song I'd play on air. Aww. Straight up, I said that to myself. Only three surfers were rescued.
No, it didn't, McFry. Well, yeah. Forgot what it was. I think maybe. Shit, almost five or six months ago now. I kind of one day thought of what if I was to take off and have to leave this freaking site entirely. That was like. I have the most kick ass freaking outro of people that would actually remember me when I'm gone from here and yeah. Although that's God knows how long from now because unless I'm getting a freaking gig or joining a band or doing other shit, I'm stuck still at a freaking retail job until I figure out something. When I showed um, mom some of the material, she said, oh, Rollins doesn't suck. He's actually good. She just doesn't want me to just waste my money on going to a meet and greet. But I'll try to run her down. Yeah, I mean... I spent God knows so much with meeting Billy West, but it's a whole thing. Honestly, I could see Rollins as a as a supportive dad figure. In a way. You know, because literally, like, why not? Oh, dang, this is dark now. Best thing Rollins did, punk. What year was this? Well, this is when he was still in Black Flag, baby. Yeah, I think he was just out of high school then. Yeah, 1981. Oh, he was 20. Oh, they really know what I like it. Although no one else really remembers the rest of the band that's up in Rollins. He's the, the de facto face of the band. And there are other people that were jealous. They're like, you ruined this. Well, I mean, also if you want to talk about Robo, but only drummers were in the Including myself. Because the dude has distinct style and punk. Or punk drums, I should say. After this, the song that sort of got me in the black flag. Next, uh. Oh, wait, maybe if I remember. This kid I used to talk to in high school named Bryce. He got me into this song in Black Flag later on. And I'm like, thank God, another punk hit. I could actually hang out. Because, yeah, not fun when you're in a prep school full of people that want to become doctors and shit. And get married by the time you're 20. And it may or may not be the right person. Now, trust me. I look at most of your freaking TikToks and I'm like... Hell. Hell, you get married and I've been through too many broken relationships to count. Oh, hey, Mayor, no. Hey, Mayor. What a Invite you fans. And don't shove a two by four if you know stay. He wrote about what he went what he and the others went through called get in the van. It's interesting. I didn't read it. I read the synopsis of it on TV Pro. I swear I could be on that website all day. Hey, it's coming to fan. Yo, I'm glad I just say uh, don't shove a two by four up your nose because I say don't shove a two by four up your ass. People are going to be questioning me on a whole other level. Then again, too, I was still 18 at the point coming back on here and really wasn't speaking my mind, and now I'm 20 and freaking speaking my damn mind way too much. 
I spoke my mind even in high school. I was always I speak speaking my, my mind. mind. No, I've spoke my mind way too much on other people's open mics, Heather. Even uh, Ryan with the whole uh, him acting wholesome 24-7 and me just coming in with the most vulgar stuff I could think of possible. And you know me that well, I basically have that crap. It's like when you saw me as a, a bungle bunny and you're like, what have I done to you? And I was like, you didn't do anything. I mean, I say a question out with everyone I've run into, but yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, the Power Rangers. This is in two parts also, so yeah. It's only because he at least goes through the history, and when I was trying to search up the Super Sentai versus Power Rangers reviews, most of them are an hour, and I'm like, yeah, this is the oh, more thank you, my Here's some confessions from a nerd. I have never seen Power Rangers. Yeah, meaning I've seen only clips and have never watched a full episode. I never could but that's watch about it. to change. I'm gonna check it out and give you my first impression. I mean, now keep in mind, I'm seeing this for the first time though. as an adult. I can never go back in time and see it as a kid the way it was intended. I was about to say the only time that really what um now when i started watching power rangers oddly enough it was 2011 and this is before i had cable and i just lounged on other people's couches while chris was working for them and was just binging their cable and watched literally several episodes of power rangers in a row hours on end and did that for a God knows so long. I can never be as nostalgic and as well seasoned with it as many fans may be, but, but I still I have a personal quit watching history it after and experience with it. A very misguided experience, which I'd like to share. So if you're already hey, a big old fan zombie, of the show, how you, doing? you might not learn any new Why information from me, but you'll probably get a unique perspective. And if you're a noob like me, then you can come share the discovery. I've been aware of the show's existence since the very beginning. Its impact was. Did you get a lot of the original Power Rangers cast out to Kinetic on one year? Turtles, all Never met any of them, but. I loved yeah. as a kid. But somehow with Power Rangers, I missed the boat. I may have been a little bit too oh, old or was too busy getting into horror movies. I know the reason why, because I went to go see the Nostalgia Critic. And monster right. movies. When you obsess over something, it usually means you miss out in something else. Also, I've always had a tendency to ignore whatever is the newest popular thing. I got annoyed with it. I specifically remember it being the most popular Halloween costume. <laughs> Here is actual footage from Halloween 94. My friend's younger brother came to my party with this costume, and all I could think is, oh, it's What's a the Letterman Power <laughs> show. Even with I Teenage Mutant Ninja year. Turtles, when I first heard the title, I thought it sounded like the dumbest oh, James thing has been ever. Around. Mighty oh yeah, Marvel I'm just Power thinking. Rangers? Yeah, that like was what, Park Rangers. That's the style of Morphin? Oh. What does that mean? Looking back, it sounds like morphine. I wrote it off as just a kids <laughs> show and moved past it. I was more adult, more cool. Now let me I watch roll, my Godzilla giddy, what movies. Up? My first touch of regret <laughs> happened a few years after the show made its mark. What's a that? group of friends and I were sitting around watching TV. We flipped through some channels and happened to land on Power Rangers, but only for a moment. What I saw was a giant robot fighting a rubber suit monster in a city. My friends were making fun of it, saying, oh, it's that stupid Power Ranger show, so cheesy. And I was we sitting there good. thinking, wait a minute, this looks awesome. It was just like a Godzilla movie. It was not what I expected. In the 90s, I was the only Godzilla fan I knew. Nobody else liked this shit, and that only oh, yeah. fired me James up and made me like it more. It. Rubber suit monsters. Yeah, That's until what life is all about. Think people it looks had cheesy? More, well, fuck you. People got There's direct TV, and they were exposed to more channels and sci-fi channels TV. would it's show marathons for a while. Monsters? This yeah. was a major contradiction. Well, like first you know what I was doing when Power Rangers was on? I was ordering Laserdisc to VHS transfers from Japan of the newest Godzilla films and any other obscure monster movies. But all I had Laser to do was turn really on the TV and I'd didn't. see a new monster every week. Then I heard something crazy. Funny a thing, Heather, piece of a lot of anime that's from that time you can only... No DVDs or like freaking other crap of it. You can literally only get it still to this day either on Laserdisc or VHS. Or just Laserdisc. 
So you better hope you have that thousand dollar laser disc machine lying around. Of information that would completely and know change how to my operate view of Power Rangers. The show was made in Japan. But the next time I caught dun, a glimpse dun, dun. of the show, I saw something that resembled a TV sitcom with teenagers. This couldn't be the same show. Yep. It looked like a Saved by the Bell knockoff. It was silly and dumb, but not in any of the ways I wanted it to be. It definitely was not Japanese. It looked like the most American show you could possibly see. So then I was confused and continued to disregard it. Sometime after the internet age began, I became increasingly aware that Power Rangers was something that would have been right up my alley. But the idea of watching it cold and trying to catch up after all these years seemed too daunting. As the demands of adulthood grew, I wondered, did I miss my opportunity? Would it still appeal to me today? I have to find out. Alright, it's been on the list for years and now I'm finally looking into it. First of all, is the show Japanese or is it American? Apparently it's both. Generally the monster scenes were shot in Japan while the scenes with the teenagers were in the United States. That makes enough sense. But wait, the Japanese footage was recycled from a completely separate show called Super yeah. Sentai. The plot thickens. So there's two different shows both coexisting and both still going on to this very day. Is that you have to watch Super Sentai also? Um, absolutely. Oh, man. <laughs> now there's two shows I want to watch. I feel like my responsibility just doubled. I feel like I gave birth to twins. Wait, Super Sentai began in 1975? And it's still going on to this very day? Yeah. They've been making episodes consistently for the past 42 years. I'm going to die. Well, 42 years as Super in Sentai 2017, but that would now be... 48 and the superheroes they wear color-coded costumes and save the earth from evil monsters mm -hmm. this description naturally sounds like power rangers but it also sounds like common rider which is from the same creator basically if you have a bunch of people in motorcycle suits flipping around in the air with explosions lasers and sparks shooting all over you know the deal the deal is it's fucking awesome ever seen specter man dude that shit is Maybe crazy 48. how about the toei spider-man yeah it's spider-man with giant robots then there's ultraman which is pretty much where it all started that was 1966 and the ultra series is still going on today also it was created by ag superaya the special effects pioneer who we have to thank for making Godzilla. Godzilla once fought alongside an Ultraman type character called Jet Jaguar and Godzilla appeared in many Zone Fighter episodes that was along weird. with other characters from the Godzilla franchise including Guy Gan and King Ghidorah. The same Japanese superhero genre which spawned Power Rangers is intertwined with the Godzilla franchise and if we haven't opened up a big enough can of worms already these franchises fall under the umbrella term tokusatsu. This is a mother genre which generally includes any films that rely heavily on special effects such as giant monster movies, of course, which I've always known mean, as kaiju films. Then you have human sized monster Hills. films like the Master, yeah, I heard of that. series like Super Beverly Sentai, Hills Tattoo Teenage like Ninja. The series, which are about giant robots controlled by people like yeah. Gunhead, the giant robo series, and even this crosses over into the Godzilla franchise. Okay, I've only watched one percent of the giant robo series. The giant robo of the earth today stood still is freaking dope. Characters such as Mecha Godzilla and Mecha Ghidra, and then you take it a step further with Combiner Robots, which plays a big part in Power Rangers. It's robots that come together to form bigger robots like Voltron and Transformers, and now we're getting into animation, anime. Holy fuck! This is bad for me. You know that, right? Like when it comes to this stuff, I can't stop. I'm like an alcoholic. I was doing good, but now I'm over my head. So I gotta settle down. All right, we're talking Power Rangers here. All right, how about this? I watched just the first season. That's it. Just one season. Let's see if it's on Netflix. Oh, good, it is. Let's check it out. <laughs> it's 60 episodes. 60 fucking episodes, you think? Buddy, that's I've watched all of Inuyasha. That's nothing. Oh my god. Oh, jeez, I need some help. Been wanting to get schooled in Power Rangers, but too overwhelmed. Decide to watch just the first season. Lo and behold, it's 60 episodes. Oh man, I need help. 
dude, I got you covered. Huh. Well, thanks, Linkara. Hey, didn't I debate that guy one time on who would win in a fight, Mecha Godzilla or Megazord, even though I had no idea who Megazord was? Well, anyway, he's reviewed everything Power Rangers, so let this be my guide to the show. <laughs> um, do I need a guide for the guide? And Netflix has two different versions of the first season. There's the original and the remastered series. Do I have to watch that too? Plot-wise, nothing is different about them. And frankly, I see no reason to watch 60 episodes of the same show twice just for sparkles. <sighs> oh, thank God. Anyway... I'm going to begin watching Power Rangers. Something that was meant to be watched once a week over the course of 20 years, I'm going to consume it all at once. Wish me luck. This is the crap I used to do all the time before coming on the U now. Go, go Power Rangers! Go, go! Actually, I swear to God, Heather, this is the stuff I used to do for a year straight before coming on here. Oh, go, go, Power Rangers! Go, go, Power Rangers! Go, go, Power Rangers! <laughs> oh, man, I think I've caused myself serious mental damage. This was way too much to ingest all at once. But I'm now familiar with the show. I've skimmed through the first three seasons, plus I've seen the first two movies. With the first season, I watched the first 30 episodes straight, and after that I realized it would be impossible to finish, plus I wanted to see seasons two and three to close out the Mighty Morphin era, so I watched the majority of the rest of them in fast speed, stopping only to watch the most important episodes based on what Linkara and the internet in general seem to recommend the most. When I say I'm now familiar with the show, I mean I can now finally distinguish all the names like Goldar, Zord, Zordon, and Zordled, I mean Lord Zed. Why do they have to sound so similar? Zordon. The basic gist, if you're new to this too, it's about five normal teenagers who are active in gymnastics, martial arts, and working out. They're recruited to fight against evil by the good guy Zordon, a blue floating head who operates in a base situated on top Fazkes rocks. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. They just slapped it on there. Oh, it's that's a real great. place, too. He has an assistant named Alpha 5, who I can't stand. All he says is, ay, 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 and it gets really annoying really fast. I like the design. Like the I keep saying, at least it ain't jocking from Inuyasha. Like an elaborate Christmas display. I mean, it's a pretty spectacular still want to kill that robot, little too. but I've just had enough with that voice. The main villain who prompts Zordon into enlisting the teenagers is an alien witch with a cone bra who's been floating around space in a garbage can for many years. To be exact, 10,000 years, as you'll be reminded at the start of every episode. Her name is Rita. <laughs> Rita. It's like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The wizard named Tim. There are some who call me... Tim. <laughs> Of course, her full name is Rita Repulsa, and that's pretty fitting. Anyway, Zordon gives the teenagers power coins, which they redeem at the video arcade to get lots of free games. No, that would be silly. It turns them into color-coded superheroes wearing spandex suits and motorcycle helmets. It gives them the powers of ancient animals like a saber-toothed tiger, mastodon, and dinosaurs. But they're all robots. The show just started, and we're already talking about robot dinosaurs. What else could possibly happen in 23 seasons? I have no fucking idea. So these ancient robot animals are called Zords, and they don't do much other than come running out of volcanoes oh, and shit uh, looking ninjas, awesome. Ninjas, magic, space, do etc. Because they don't have time. Right away, they all combine together to form Megazord, and that's when shit gets really crazy. I actually had to stop watching and take a break. It's too much. Like, when does watching this sort of thing start to feel normal? I find it really amusing how the Power Rangers can't say anything without punching and doing all this shit in the air. It's like, can't they stand still for one second? Also, I can't get over how many times they say the word power. This is your power lance, a weapon of great power. This is the power sword, key to all the weapon's powers. You can make a drinking game out of it. I wonder if they had a subscription to Nintendo Power. 
the terminology in this show gets nuts. In the episode Oyster Stew, they actually use the term oysterizer. Dude, oysterizer. Oysterizer. There's also Bulk and Skull. These are the comedy characters. They're completely exaggerated, especially with Skull's high-pitched Riddler laugh. They're always getting hit by pies and cakes. Everything they say or do is usually followed up with cartoon sound effects. They're often trying to figure out the true identity of the Power Rangers, but other than that, they're just comic relief. I had no idea they would be main characters of the show. This surprised me. They even become police officers later on, and they almost got their own show. I don't really know what to think of them. They're kind of lovable in a silly way, but I don't feel like they belong. You're watching a show about superheroes fighting monsters, and then all of a sudden a slapstick tornado comes flying in to wreck every other scene. As expected, the most appealing part of the show for me is the monster battles. I've compared the effects to Godzilla, but it'll be more accurate to compare them to Gamera. If you've seen a lot of the Gamera films, you'll notice the effects are much cheaper and the monster designs are a lot more ridiculous. You have a monster with a saw on its head, but let's get even more ridiculous. In Power Rangers, you have a turtle with a traffic light on its head. Or an upside down pumpkin head. There's a new monster just about every week, and they're all absurd, and they talk. If I saw this as a kid, I would have lost my shit. Imagine a Gamera villain saying things like, have a nice trip, and the pumpkin head raps. There's even a Frankenstein monster. I so badly want to invent a time machine to hey, go back Princess to my Destiny teenage Girl. self and scream in my ear, what are you doing? Watch this show. My only complaint is that the monsters don't interact with the buildings very much, but I can understand that it's a TV budget. They do smash the buildings every now and then, especially later in the third season, and whenever that happens, I get excited. I just love seeing practical effects. You can tell when something is actually getting destroyed on camera rather than being animated on a computer. I also have to comment on the Megazord costume. Considering how bulky this thing looks, the actor inside is actually able to get a lot of movement out of it. In every episode, the Power Rangers fight a bunch of people in gray spandex called the putties, which are made from turds baked in a cookie mold. Then they fight a wise-cracking monster who grows into a larger monster, and they call the Zords to form Megazord, and the episode switches drastically into giant Japanese monster battle mode. A giant power sword is summoned, which comes out of thin air into Megazord's hand in a flashy light show. The enemy monster is finished off, falling face first. We jump cut to a burst hey, of sparks Maddie. in the monster's place. We usually get a low-angle shot looking up at Megazord being victorious, and the whole time, that energizing metal theme Theme song is rocking you senseless. It's almost reminiscent of Iron Maiden. One episode is all it takes to get stuck in your head, let alone hundreds. When you hear Go Go Power Rangers, you're thinking, yeah, damn straight, go Power Rangers. After watching a ton of these, I started to feel like I was watching the same thing over and over again, and parts of it, I actually was. The sequence where the Zords form Megazord is the same recycled footage repeated every episode. After a while, they start abridging the footage so you don't have to see the whole Zord sequence. But if you were a latecomer Thank just you. tuning in, it wouldn't make any sense at all. It just looks like a bunch of random shit flashing together. This shameless footage recycling surprisingly took a long time to get old for me, only because it's so awesome. The shot where the T-Rex Zord comes out of the volcano is very well executed. The fire and heat distorts the image. It's a great touch. I also like the saber-toothed tiger. It looks like a runaway action figure. It all looks like a toy commercial, not just the fact that the Zords are all miniatures, but the way it's paced with all the fast editing and in-your-face camera angles. It sort of escalates the style of toy commercials into a pop art. And once the Dragon Zord is introduced, Oh my, this thing is really cool. This could have totally fit in with the Godzilla universe. And then there's all these different Zord combinations like Thunder, Megazord. Yeah, just simple Megazord's no longer enough. And then there's Ultra Zord, who has a massive Ultra Boner. At the start of the second season, Lord Zed becomes the main villain. What do you say about this guy? Just look at him. His brain is exposed, he's got no skin, and he's wearing metal underwear. He walks like he took a dump in him. And look, duct tape. There's totally duct tape on his staff. <laughs> Later on, Rita comes back and the two of them get married. Did not expect that. Lord Zed was not originally part of Sentai. He was created specifically for Power Rangers. 
As mentioned, the show partly uses recycled footage from Super Sentai, and it's fun to pick out which footage is recycled and which is original. The scenes with the monsters and special effects are usually Super Sentai, and the scenes with the American actors are original footage for Power Rangers. It's a lot like the first Godzilla movie, how they filmed new scenes with Raymond Burr for the American version. They could have just redubbed it, but I guess they wanted to make it more appealing for American audiences. I find it interesting to try and identify the Sentai footage. It would be an extended project, but I would really love to watch through a season of Super Sentai and compare the two shows. I can tell the obvious things. For instance, whenever we see Bronson Cave or Vasquez Rocks, we know it was shot in America. It's interesting to see how American and Japanese scenes cut together. For example, the main cast will be at Bronson Cave, then a fight breaks out, and all of a sudden the background changes to a generic, dry, rocky landscape. It looks similar enough to pass, but we know we just leaped across the Pacific. Rita was originally part of the Sentai footage. They just dubbed her. She never shares any scenes with the American cast, at least not early on. What I find real interesting is the actor who plays Rita gets changed quite a bit, but the voice actor stays the same. You're seeing a different face, but hearing the same voice. I was almost fooled. Is it her? Is it not? It plays with your mind. Also, I could be wrong, but I think they shipped some of the Sentai monster costumes overseas to complete more scenes for Power Rangers, and since the costumes had already been used, they probably had more damage, like they got the sloppy seconds. If so, this may be the reason there's some scenes where Goldar's mouth is malfunctioning. It moves by some kind of animatronic or puppeteer work, and in most scenes it works decent, but there's a lot of times in what seems like localized footage where the mouth is stuck open, moving only a little. And this is really funny to see when he's talking in that growly voice. Oh, you think you're going to save your friend, don't you? You gave up too easily. They're all in trouble now. Fool, you just given the dragon dagger to me. Oh, no. Also, Super Sentai had the habit of changing the ranger suits every season, and each season was given a different title, like Zoo Ranger, Die Ranger, and when Power Rangers started, Super Sentai was already on its 16th season, or series, or whatever you want to call it. It was already a success in Japan, so when Power Rangers came along and was also a success internationally, it seemed they didn't want to risk losing that success, so they didn't change it as much. The point is, a lot of the action footage of the rangers in the suits was from Sentai. It was the Japanese actors, since you couldn't recognize them in the suits anyway. They just redubbed the voices. But they couldn't yo, do that get anymore boy, what after up? the suits changed. Not that they couldn't, but they chose doing, not to. So they continued to use the old suits and had to come up with all these sneaky ways to adapt the footage they had, to reshoot, re-edit footage, and work around whatever curveball Super Sentai would throw that year. And to this very day, that tradition still continues. Yeah, doing good. I Streams find that a bit very impressive. Tonight, but still, there's a lot of things I'm that do change. About halfway into the first season, there's the introduction of a Green Ranger who summons the Dragon Zord by playing the flute with a knife. In the second season, he loses Yo, his knife power flute. and he goes away, but he comes back shortly as the White Ranger, who How has this hilarious talking now? sword. After five the White hours. Ranger suit was in tune with the Sentai Dai Ranger suit, so while they didn't upgrade the rest of the Rangers, they at least used one of the same suits, which meant they could use Japanese footage of the White Ranger. Also, halfway into season two, three of the Ranger cast members are changed out because of contractual reasons, but they acknowledge it. Zordon transfers their power over to the new Rangers, but they go on wearing the same costumes. It's like the band Kiss, switching out members but keeping the same personas. It's a shame. I was just starting to like these characters. And deep into the third season, Kimberly goes too. I can imagine exactly how this must have felt if you watched this as a teenage boy. It would have probably felt like there's this girl in your class who you really like and who you're just starting to know, and she gets transferred to another school. Damn. Over time, Power Rangers started adapting more to Sentai, updating the suits and accepting the change that came with every season. Power Rangers Zeo, Power Rangers Turbo, and so on. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Movie came in between the second and third season. I heard it was non-canon and didn't follow the continuity of the show, so I assumed it didn't matter what order I watched it in, so I decided to watch it while I was still halfway into the first season. When I saw the new Ranger characters, I figured that was just the lack of continuity everyone was talking about. Then I saw the second season and how all these characters were introduced, and now I wish I watched it in order. Whether it's canon or not, 
it does follow the progression of the show. Anyway, this is one of those certain kind of movie adaptations that could only exist in the 90s. It just has that wacky nature. It kind of reminds me of the Super Mario Brothers movie. It has that same level of quality. It's garbage, but it's delightful. It looks like a more cinematic version of the show, which it should. You can tell everything's been updated to be more like movie quality, but it still has the same cheesiness. The villain, Ivan Ooze, kind of reminds me of Freddy Krueger and the guy from the Nightmare board games. Rita, Lord Zed, and Goldar are all there too, so it's definitely over cluttered with villains. The biggest takeaway thing I have to say about this film is during the third act when all the action happens, it goes full CG. No practical effects, no Super Sentai stock footage to work with, obviously. But my god, this might be the worst CG I've ever seen in a mainstream film. It's mid-90s, I don't expect everything to look as great as Jurassic Park, which of course used practical effects in combination with its CG, but this looks horrible. It's worse than PlayStation 1 graphics. Even with uh. bad practical effects, there's charm to it, but this has no charm. Or maybe it does. Does it? The second film, Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, occurs between the Zeo and Turbo series. Yeah, I skipped ahead, just so I can say I've seen all the movies. The first thing I took note of is that the Rangers don't get into the suits until about 30 minutes in. In the show, things are always happening fast, as if they think you have no patience whatsoever, but this movie does the opposite. It's more like anti-Turbo. There's a young kid who becomes the new Blue Ranger, but when he morphs into the suit, he grows into adult size. If they were going to use an adult for the action scenes, why'd they cast a kid at all? The main villain is Divatox, and look, there's no way around it. Her boobs are showing off in every scene. It's a major distraction. <laughs> These right here are the real stars of the film. Kimberly and Jason oh, come back, but the whole what time distraction. they're either captured or turned evil. There's some really weird creature effects. These wizard guys have these big, cute eyes. Oh, look See, at that. See, Steven gets They kind of have this oh, innocent God, expression, what the but I don't know what Ewok to make of it. Like, it's just bizarre. <laughs> then there's this hey, villain oh, no. henchman who always has this freaky grin. <laughs> oh, God, it, it's bugging I'm me good. out. I think they did a great job creating these faces, but they don't move very much. Freaking There's not much balls. of a range of expression. Just a weird frozen face. The Megazord Homie fight sequence, like or should I say, his Turbo face. Megazord, the is the highlight because the effects are practical. This rectifies the lousy CG from the first movie, and it's upgraded from the TV quality. This looks like what I'd expect. This is the movie version of the Megazord fight sequence. For this reason, I prefer Turbo over the first movie, but neither of them are very good. The new film, Power Rangers, is on the way shortly. I plan on seeing I it, saw and I'm glad movie. I now finally know something about the show. This was one of the reasons I kicked my ass into gear. My general impression from the trailers is that it's trying too much to be like the shitty Transformers movies. I'm so sick of those. But we'll see what happens. I hope it honors the show rather than following with whatever trends are going on nowadays. Of course they have to update it. It should be updated. It should look and feel like a big budget colossal revamp of the show. I just hope it keeps the same spirit. And also, I hope it has the theme song. Now that I'm familiar with the franchise, what can I say? How do I wrap this up? Well, it's a lot of fun. Is it for kids? Yes. Is it for cult monster fans? Yes. Is it stupid? Yes. Is it awesome? Yes. It's every contradictory thing I ever thought it would be. It made Japanese monsters popular in America, even if we didn't realize it. And for that, I thank Power Rangers from the perspective of a noob. Or, should I say, a new fan. Well, yeah. I think what was, what was it? One of the movies was apparently the original cut was going to be like four freaking hours, which I'm like, why? But they cut out so much more crap for it, and now there's lost scenes from... Actually, yeah, it was Turbo. They cut out like two hours of footage or something. Rick. What the hell? Hold on. 
up my ass, see what the hell this is. Give it a minute. I was happy in the hands of a drunken hour, but heaven knows I'm doing your mama. I was looking for your mom and now I found your mom. And heaven knows I'm doing what is your this? mom in uh. my life. Why do I get valuable son? <laughs> Um, is this a serious group? No, this is a meme of the Smiths of the doing your mom thing. <laughs> Hold up. Oh, was this crap? I just deployed a lot. Doing your mouth. <laughs> Doing oh, no. Wait, I gotta save this for Doing Ryan's next mouth. open mic. <laughs> Doing your mouth. your mouth. We know we straight. We do in your mouth. Oh, no, they did not do All Star by Johnny Cash. Oh, wait, the giant cash version? Hold up. You, you have to go back. It, it, hold on, go back a little bit, you'll see. Damn it. No. Uh, <laughs> play. Somebody once told me. Why do it to her? No! <laughs> That's a beautiful song! That's literally the last one he recorded I for his death. The sharpest tool. And it carries the the emotion with it too. In the shed. She was looking kind of dumb <laughs> with her finger and her thumb. In the shed. Damn it, I oh, didn't no! read it! I can't. He's just gonna ruin the song. On her forehead. <laughs> oh, I see where this is going. Well, the years start coming. And they don't stop. Oh, this only got 3,000 views so far. Fed to the rules. And the tears don't stop coming. And, and they don't I stop coming. And they all the ground oh. running. Wait. Hey. Oh, you're an all-star. Get your game on. Hell no. Nah, Wait, did. is that Jeremy Renner? What happened? Oh, dang. Somebody got mad. 